Good morning, everyone. I was referring to, I'm so sorry, but if you go to the glycemic index, I'm going to go up again. Um, I've said here, the spelling is incorrect. It's glycemic index of food. Okay. Um, there's a description, but before we get to the description, that's what I've been talking about. Um, you will see there's a, um, the page has been copied twice, but this is, this um, um, paragraph was left out with the first one. So this is what I want to have a look at because I want you to understand quickly first of all what happens to the um, carbohydrates when we eat it. So let's quickly have a look. This is what I was talking about now. So I want to look at it bit by bit. Okay, so the paragraph that I've just highlighted is basically just set out to make it a bit easier to understand. So after you eat carbohydrate rich, rich foods, you will find that the carbohydrates are broken down into glucose. Now glucose, it's uh, the building blocks of all carbohydrates. So this is um, what the carbohydrates are broken down into when it's digested. And then the glucose is then absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, and when, when it's absorbed into the bloodstream, the blood glucose levels rises. So we're talking about, we refer to it as your sugar is high, high sugar, high blood glucose levels. Okay, so the glucose le levels rises. And then what happens is when you've got high blood glucose, when there's a lot of glucose in the blood, the pancreas is going to release insulin the hormone insulin is going to be released into the bloodstream to deal with this glucose the function of the insulin is to take the glucose out of the um, blood and take it to the cells so then the glucose will be transported from the bloodstream into the cells with the help of the insulin okay and so when this happens this causes the blood glucose levels to drop Right, and then we find that the glucose will be changed to energy in the body cells. Okay, so this is the basic, and this is important information that you know because this is going to help you understand um, what we're talking about when we go into all of the rest of the stuff with regards to the GI and the hypo and hyperglycemia as well as diabetes. Okay, so that's why I wanted to highlight that. Okay, so let's go back to um, our notes. Okay, so now let's quickly go back. Now I've highlighted on my page, so I want to have a look at. So now we've got that background information that's important. And then, of course, remember the definition. You need to know what the glycemic index of food is. So um, the, as I said, um, this is stuff that you need to study, okay? So um, just to, 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 to quickly have a look at the definition, when we have a look at the glycemic index of food or the GI, um, in short, it is um, it me me measures, okay? It's a measure, sorry, that ranks what? Carbohydrate-rich foods, how? On a scale of 1 to 100, okay? And what does it um measure okay it looks at and it's based on how fast and to what extent glucose levels rise after food is ingested so when we look at the glycemic index of food you're going to see that we look at um, different levels high gi medium gi low gi okay so these are the different types that we get um so you'll see there glucose is taken as a hundred and everything else is um um, and and it's, it's, it's taken as a hundred because it's the largest and fastest rise in blood glucose levels. Um, and everything else is then compared to that, right? So um, when we look at, and I'm going to go to my slide again. Okay. So these are the three main groups, as you can see them over here. Okay. Um, what we want to have a look at when we have a look at the three main groups is what is the effect on the blood glucose level, okay? So the high GI foods, um, they are 70, 71 plus, intermediate foods, GI foods 55 to 69, and then your low GI foods 55 or less. This is information that you need to know. You need to know your three um, different types of um, GIs, 
Okay, and then the effect, and then of course the examples that we find. These are the only these are the examples mentioned in your textbook. So these are the only examples of interest for you. Okay, you don't need to know anything else. So first of all, there then we see that when we take in high GI foods, like for example, cake, rice, cake, um, sweets, um, um, cornflakes, any of those that's mentioned there, it causes a sudden rapid rise of blood glucose levels. Okay, sudden rapid so um it's going to be broken down quite easily within a short period of time that is basically what it's saying and then the intermediate um gi foods it causes a moderate increase in the blood glucose levels so it is the rye bread your bran muffins oats condensed milk pineapples etc so they won't um if, if we compare it to the high gi foods it's uh, it won't be broken down as quickly, okay, so uh, they will cause a moderate increase in the blood glucose levels, and then the low GI foods, um, these um, are released slowly and steadily into the bloodstream, okay, so the gl glucose levels are kept constant, so these, this is um, good, okay, so there you can see the examples, milk, yogurt, low GI bread, seed, loaf, provitas, etc., so that that's your low GI foods, okay? So the, the glucose, are, there's not a sudden rise. It's a slow, steady rise, okay? And um, the levels are kept constant. So um, these are going to keep you fuller for longer. If you eat low GI foods, you're going to have sustained energy, okay? Um, um, in comparison to the high GI foods. Right, let me go back here. Okay. Okay, so that's what I've been saying. Okay, then we just quickly want to have a look at when we we can make use of a, a graph like this one here. You can see um, when we have a look at the X and the Y axis here, it looks at the blood glucose levels. Okay, so here we have a look at how the blood glucose levels increases. Okay, over what period of time? And so we're comparing high GI foods with low GI foods. And what you need to notice, and you should be able to describe this if you know the differences between those, is that when we eat high GI indicated in the red over here, there's a rapid rise in blood sugar. So that it's going to be, the your carbohydrates are going to be broken down much more faster at a faster rate, right? And so this will lead to a rapid um, rise in blood sugar as indicated. And the thing over here, if we have a look at time, okay, because what is why is there going to be a, um, a rapid fall also is because now the pancreas is going to be um, secreting insulin, a lot of insulin to deal with all of this um, blood glucose and to take it out of the blood. Okay, so then we're going to find this rapid fall in blood sugar. So sometimes we have a sugar crash, what is known as a sugar crash. crash. If you've eaten a lot of sweet foods okay um with nothing else for example a lot of high gi foods then you are going to feel energized for a short period of time and all of a sudden you're going to feel oh you're going to feel tired this is basically what what's happening if you're just eating high gi foods okay then um when we have a look at low gi foods there is a slow increase over time as you can see it's not this rapid rise as with the high gi so it's a slow increase over time Okay, followed by a gradual fall in sugar. Okay, so we don't have, we've got sustained um, energy because the glucose is being released slowly into the blood, right? So this is how we can use this graph to explain the differences between the two. And it's important that you also understand and know how to explain that. Right, we're going to, um, you'll see there's some pages like the one that I've got on the screen um that you can use it um to outline it's just outlines so you can use it when you study um to fill in the missing information okay by obviously once you've studied <coughs> okay i've put a little note low and high blood glucose level so we we see now we've looked at um glycemic index and we know that it measures how fast and to what extent um, the food is going to be broken down or turned into glucose into the blood. Um, but we know that um, food 
or carbohydrate rich foods for example um, influences the amount of glucose that we've got in our uh, blood at a time okay so we want a sustained amount which is between they say four millimoles to um, about 5.4 um, if they take your um, your um, fasting glucose levels in other words if you haven't eaten then it should be between four and 5.4 um, uh, millimoles um, per liter in your blood anything that's um, um, high for a long time is going to be a problem. Okay, so let's quickly have a look and understand then, because sometimes having hypoglycemia, which is low blood glucose, versus having hyperglycemia, which is high blood, blood glucose, both of these are conditions which is not good. Okay, so you want um, your blood glucose levels to be normal. Okay, so when we have a look at those, hypoglycemia, low blood glucose okay so please know the terms and then hyperglycemia refers to high blood glucose okay um so in uh, with hyperglycemia the blood glucose levels drop abnormally low okay so i've said um normal is between four to five um 5.4 so if your glucose level is lower than four okay i've put something in there four um, millimoles per liter to five millimoles per liter that's your normal fasting blood glucose levels okay just so that you have a, a basic idea okay what is regarded as normal right and then we've got get hyperglycemia okay so here we find that the blood glucose levels become abnormally high okay abnormally high um, so yeah higher than what it should be and that is also a problem okay so just um, some causes there, um, you, you would have seen that you um, are going to have very high blood glucose levels if you eat food that only contains um, high GI, if you eat high GI foods. Um, so you'll find that the in hypoglycemia, sorry, the body overreacts and the pancreas produces too much insulin. So um, because of the uh, all of the insulin being produced, this causes a rapid drop in blood glucose. Right. Um, what causes this irregular eating habits? OK, so people that um, starve or don't eat when they're supposed to be eating a poor diet with high GI foods. OK, so now it makes sense because we've looked at um, what happens with um, high GI foods when we eat it. And this can be a, 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 a dire complication for diabetes, people that suffers from di um, diabetes. Um, Right, um, especially if they're taking too much insulin or tablets, eat too little food, eat later than usual, skip meals, drinking alcohol, practice too hard, and then also taking certain medications and a, a tumor in the pancreas can cause this to happen. Okay, um, so you need to know the differences between those two, and then um, too much um, food that's high in sugar or high GI, you will see will also can also um, cause hyperglycemia there you go meals eating so that information they're also important i'm not gonna um, look at stuff in detail Is this... right um okay so have a look at the at the symptoms as well okay the, to differentiate between the two okay so it's there Right, so the other thing that we want to have a look at um, and that's important is how do we prevent hypoglycemia and how do we prevent hyperglycemia. So for hypoglycemia, eat regular meals and snacks, right, preferably those with low G, from low GI foods and then um, you are not, in, say, um, you're not told to not eat high GI foods but rather um, have it in combination with low GI foods or high protein foods. Um, and when people suffer from hyperglycemia, um, you will see that sometimes people uh, um, have this condition where they're pre-diabetic. Okay? It might be that they've been suffering from hyperglycemia for a while and then, um, yeah, they start suffering from diabetes, right? So they need to apply good management pr principles. So we'll have a look at that um, when we have a look at diabetes as well. 
And so management is important. Okay, so how are we going to manage? This is important, eat low GI foods because we want a gradual release of glucose into the bloodstream, right? So that we don't have this overproduction of insulin. Um, and then of course, um, in cases where the blood sugar level has um, fallen to a point where people are fainting and, and not feeling well and dizzy and all of those, right? They can take in something like glucose, tablets, sugar, honey, maize, syrup, raisin, sweets, something sweet to elevate the blood sugar levels or blood glucose levels. Eat meals regularly, exercise regularly. It promotes the action of um, insulin, helps insulin to work better. Okay, and then as I said, we're going to have a look at um, diabetes as well. So this is just an illustration to have a look at the differences. Um, if we have a look at the blood glucose levels, the white um, will be the glucose and obviously the red is the, the blood cells. So um, this is just to give you an idea of what it would look like if we suffer from hypoglycemia, low blood glucose levels, normal blood glucose levels, we've got enough um, glucose in there for sustained energy. And then hyperglycemia, where we've got um, too much um, glucose in the blood. Okay, and we're going to have a look at that when we look at diabetes. So I'm going to skip. We're not going to have a look at um, osteoporosis, even though the notes are like that. I first want to have a look at diabetes because there's a link between what we've gone through now. So we're coming back to osteoporosis. Okay. And for this, I just want to open up here. Diabetes mellitus, this is the um, scientific name. So what is diabetes? Chronic disease, this you need to know, in which the blood glucose level is abnormally high. Okay, so over periods of time, it's abnormally high. Why does it occur? Okay, so it occurs because the pancreas, now we know that the pancreas is important um, because it releases insulin. So now in this case where people are suffering from diabetes, it's, it's either that the pan pancreas is unable to produce insulin, it cannot produce insulin, or doesn't produce enough insulin to deal with all of the blood glucose, or the insulin that's produced does not work effectively. Okay, so that is basically in a nutshell what it is. So um, I've just got mine in a table form. You also um, have that information. So we, we find with um, diabetes, we get different types. We get what is known as type 1 diabetes. Um, and then we get type 2 diabetes. And then we um, get a, a, a condition that's known as gestational diabetes. So let's just quickly have a look at the differences between these. Right. So you will find... Um, that with type 1, the um, diabetes, and type 2 diabetes, when we have a look at diabetics, we see that 10% um, normally suffers from type 1 and 90% suffers from type 2. Um, type 2 diabetes is also seen as a lifestyle um, um, disease or um, condition because of people's lifestyles and um, obviously nutrition, very important. So let's quickly have a look, and you need to know the differences between these two, okay? So type 1 diabetes, I'm first going to have a look at um, type 1. The pancreas is unable to produce insulin, okay? So um, you will find that here um, insulin injections are needed to control blood glucose levels, right? So people need to take insulin, they need to inject themselves. With type 1 diabetes, it is sudden. And you will find it occurs in people younger than 30. So we're looking at the differences between the two over here. So if you ask to compare the two, this is the information that you want to give. Okay. Um, so this is normally occurs in people, as it says, younger than 30. Um, so, and, it, it, and it, uh, the onset is sudden. Okay. Then with type 2 diabetes, the pancreas produces insulin, but it's either not enough or the um, um, insulin does not work effectively, okay? So know that. So with um, diabetes, it might be treated successfully without medication or tablets. Um, 
that's um, or with tablets um, that's used to help um, blood glucose control. Okay, so um, not necessarily insulin injections initially. They might just need um, medication or tablets to help with that. Please note that here the onset is gradual. It's um, when we look at our type one diabetes is um, sudden and yet it's gradual and more likely to occur in older people. Okay, so this is more prevalent in older people, but because of lifestyle and the Western diet, etc., we see that it is becoming more prevalent in children and teenagers as well. Okay, but this is um, something that's more prevalent in older people. But as I said, it can um, it's becoming more prevalent also now in teenagers and young adults. Then just um, some something that you need to know, gestational diabetes. This is a temporary condition um, that happens during pregnancy, um, gestational hypoglycemia. Um, there's hormonal changes, so that might be the reason why this occurs. So this is normally the uh, um, a type of diabetes that's only experienced during pregnancy, but it can be a precursor for type 2 diabetes for both the mother and the baby. Okay, so we need to understand the important year for grade 12 is to understand the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Okay, and then of course you need to know all of the symptoms, right? I'm not going to go over all of the symptoms. This is some, something that you need to know. Okay, and then the complications as well. Also not going to go over all of that. Um, Okay, I just want to get back to the booklet here. Okay, so basically I've gone over what I've, that's in your booklet there as well. Okay, um, just have a look at the causes. Okay, that I haven't looked at now. Um, remember with type 1 diabetes, it can be a genetic component. Okay, and then some other things that can um, cause it, infection, stress, trauma. And then with diabetes 2, Right, this is a diet that's high in GI and high in fat over time, obviously. When we've got an inactive or sedentary lifestyle, we don't exercise. Um, where people have a family history of diabetes, high stress levels, smoke, and then I've explained gestational diabetes to you. Okay, and then these are consequences. Okay, so these are um, um, what can happen, okay, if we suffer from it and we don't manage it properly then it can lead to all of those okay need to be aware of that but what is important for us is the prevention okay but what you need to know with type 1 diabetes it cannot be prevented okay it cannot be prevented with type 2 diabetes if we um we can manage it better it can be prevented first of all with a healthy diet normal um maintaining normal body weight exercising regularly and then you'll see they do not smoke okay um and so how do we manage it we've seen that type 1 diabetics okay they must have the insulin injections right with type 2 diabetics um or diabetes it depends on um um how far it is because it can be treated sometimes successfully without medication right? Um, in other instances, they will have to make use of blood glucose tablets. But then the important thing for us, and what I want you to know here, is we talk about, you'll see these dietary adjustments, okay? Know the difference between dietary and lifestyle. Dietary refers to the diet. So if the question asks you for um, diet, for, for management um, with dietary adjustments, then you need to refer to these um, and these are the lifestyle adjustments. So let's just quickly have a look at the difference and what's the importance here. Um, low fat and low GI diet. Why? Um, it's going to help control the blood glucose levels. Okay, a low a GI diet we know. And it's important that the, um, di di somebody suffering from diabetes control the um, blood glucose levels properly. Um, and then the reason... Um, why low fat is important to them is that they are prone to suffer from heart diseases. Okay, so that is why low fat is important. Um, yeah, fitter. <laughs> Number two is fats. Okay, there's just uh, um, something that didn't translate so nicely. And it says, especially saturated and your trans fats. We know these are the 
regarded as the bad fats, okay, should be limited. And why? Why should that be limited? Because they are more prone to heart disease, okay, um, and overweight in diabetics. It will help them with weight loss as well. Then they should eat more high fiber foods. Why high fiber foods? You need to know the um, adjustment and the why as well. Um, it digests slower, okay, and it prevents large fluctuations in blood glucose levels. So that's good. Right? It also reduces cholesterol levels, okay? And that helps with um, the chances of heart disease, okay? Um, and then that VBE should be examples. I didn't um, check that one. Like whole grains and fruits and vegetables, right? And your pulses also you can add. Those are high-fiber foods. And then eat regularly, Low GI snacks, do not skip meals, <clears throat> okay? Because we want to keep um, the blood glucose levels constant. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then eat five servings of fruit and vegetables. It contains no fats and it also lowers the risk of heart disease. Oily fish like salmon and sardines. Um, that contains a good cholesterol and we know good cholesterol is good because it lowers um, cholesterol levels and the risk lowers the risk of heart disease. And then, of course, foods low in sugar, right? And then also another recommendation here is eat less salt um, because they are also pr um, prone to suffer from <clears throat> heart conditions like high blood pressure, which reduces the risk of heart disease and stroke. Okay, so those are all of the stuff that you need to know. Then just when we go down, as I said, the difference between um, dietary adjustments and lifestyle adjustments. So di lifestyle has got to do with the lifestyle, as it says, alcohol, right? It needs to be limited because alcohol also raises blood glucose levels, okay? And then they need to do moderate physical activity, at least 30 minutes for five days a week. Why is exercise important? Because it lowers blood glucose levels. It also promotes, promotes weight loss and improves stress, but it also helps the body to use the insulin more effectively when you exercise. Okay? Then do not smoke as it increases your chance of developing diabetes too. And then good food care is important there. Okay. Now grade 12, what I'm going to do now at this stage, I quickly want to go and have a look at a question. So in your booklets um, from the first session, you've got the paper. So I want you to, and I'm going to come here. I'm going to change quickly. I want you to go to question, yeah, question three, the food and nutrition question. Okay, I'm going to go right down, let's see, to the memo section, because I want to just have a look at it quickly. So you will see there, it says provide definitions. If you go to question three, I hope all of you are there. Provide definitions for the following osteoporosis glycemic index. Okay, now we haven't dealt with osteoporosis as yet. So I'm quickly going to have a look at the glycemic index. Um, for three marks, remember what I always say when you have a look at your um, question, look at your mark allocation also. So you need to give the whole full definition of glycemic index, okay? Drinks, carbohydrate, rich foods. So you can see where the first mark is going to be given on a scale of 1 to 100 based on, there's the next mark, um, how the blood glucose levels rise after the food is ingested. I don't know why that got in um, part of... Um, Translation. So, okay, please be guided by mark allocation. But this is the question that I actually want us to have a look at. Right? Um, so, yeah, you have a little bit of information about, um, and, and this is um, some of the stuff that we're going to have in the paper. And it's, this stuff needs to be read and highlighted and look at stuff because that already is going to give you some information. So, yeah, they're talking about some PUA. He's a marathon athlete, runs 10 kilometers every day. Okay, so now we know he exercises regularly. Um, 
he focuses on a healthy lifestyle and diet. Okay, and the reason is because got a, he's got a family he's of type two diabetes, so they're giving you information. This information is of importance, right? Um, and then they tell you what he eats on a regular basis: low fat, unsweetened dairy products. There's apples and berries. There's fruit we see, unsweetened fruit juice, chicken fillets without the skin. Okay, lean cuts. So we see he's got low fat. He eats fish. Fresh salads, dark green vegetables, whole wheat products. Okay, so all of what they're giving you within the all of the um, the information that they're giving you is going to lead you to answers. You have now studied how we can manage it. Okay, so it's going to lead you to answers. We're going to have a look at that now. So first of all, they say, okay, describe the health condition diabetes. Also for three marks, describe. Okay, so the verb there is describe health condition, so now you need to give a, uh, a proper description, okay, disease where the blood glucose levels is abnormally, abnormally high, there's a mark, pancreas produces too little or no insulin, um, or when the body cannot use the insulin, okay, that's produced, okay, so you give all of that information, now this is the question that I want to come to, because now you need to understand the question before you can answer this. So it says, explain, first of all, with reasons, right? Now, you see, explain with reasons. So you're going to explain with reasons. They don't say how many. They don't say how many, but you can see in the mark allocations, it says three times two. So that should guide you. The three times two should guide you. Okay, I need to give, um, explain at least three different things with reasons. Why some people does not run the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So now we can go back to the information that they've given us because this question is now based on the information that they've given you, right? And so now we want to see, okay, we need to have a look at his diet and his lifestyle and see what is he doing, right, that he's not running the risk. So now let's go and see quickly how we are going to answer this. So you'll see there, please remember when you answer, refer to what um, has been given to you. Like, for example, refer to all of the information. So fruit juice, salads, vegetables, and whole wheat. These are all low, G, low GI foods, okay? With reason, now you've explained there's low GI foods, okay? You've given examples of the low GI foods that you've recognized, right? And now you're explaining. It lowers and controls blood glucose levels because that we know is important. Um, for um, a diabetes, so it's good for him, right? Then we see he's got low-fat dairy, skinless chicken, lean cut. This is all going to um, uh, indicate that he eats food low in fat, okay? And so why is this good? Because we know diabetes is, uh, diabetics, they are prone to heart disease and overweight um, so this will aid, aid in weight loss, okay? So that's why you might be um, nice and skinny. Then it says, then we also recognize that he's eating high fiber foods, okay? So when we've looked at what he eats, right, we should use that information, use the information that we've studied and now make the connection, okay? So that we can answer High fiber foods, name the foods, fruits and vegetables, whole wheat products. Why is this important? Because it digests slowly and it prevents large fluctuations in blood glucose levels. Also lowers cholesterol levels, which reduces the chances of heart disease. Right? And then we can refer to fruits and vegetables that, he, that he's eating daily as well. Contains no fats and lowers the risk of heart disease and stroke. Okay, there you can see it's fish. Right, and we know fish contains a good cholesterol, which lowers risk of heart disease. There is such a lot. We only had to give um, three, but look at all the different things that you could have said. Okay, but in order for you to get to that, to that, you will obviously have to know your work. Okay, unsweetened dairy products, unsweetened fruit juices. We know that these are low in sugar, so this will not cause blood sugar levels to rise unnecessarily. Okay, then active, 
right? He is active, promotes weight loss among overweight diabetics. We know that. But also when you're active, it improves the in action of insulin. The insulin works better. Okay. So that is how you want to approach a question like this, right? So we said there's going to be, you're going to have um, sources or resources given, right? Um, the question is going to be based. So that is where what you need to read into and how you need to connect the work that you've studied with that. Right? Because this is a higher order type of question. It's not just like briefly describe, you've studied the, the, the definition of what diabetes is and now you can just give it back. Okay, here you need to think a little bit further, right? And connect the information that you've studied with the information that you give, that, that you've been given. So application, you need to apply what you've studied. Okay, right. We are now going to have a look at... Um, let me go back. Um, let's go up and go to osteoporosis. Okay. I'm going to go to my slide on osteoporosis. Not responding. Why not? Okay, come. Okay, you obviously need to know what osteoporosis is. Okay, what is osteoporosis? It's a skeletal disease in which the bones become porous due to calcium, protein, and minerals being lost faster than, than it can be replaced. Okay, so, um, right, we find that bones become thinner, less dense, brittle, weak, and break easily. Fractures normally occur in spine, hips, or wrists. Right. So when we uh, I wanted you to have a look at this illustration over here, there we've got a normal bone, what the uh, normal bone tissue looks like and then a bone with osteoporosis. We can clearly see the difference. OK, so we can see the one is becoming less dense. It's brittle. It looks thinner than the normal bone. OK, so that is basically what osteoporosis is. There's another illustration. OK, you can see the, um, the bone with osteoporosis is more porous. Right. So um, if it become if it's more porous, it means that it can break easier, more easily than the normal bone. Right? So you need to know what osteoporosis is. Um, and then just is known as the silent disease, as there is normally no visible signs until a fracture occurs. Right? Okay, so just some background information here is that you should know that the body constantly builds new bones and replace older bones. Okay, so yeah, these are one of the things that's happening. So we find that during childhood, bones grow and repair very quickly. Bones stop growing between the ages of 16 and 18. It increases in density under the late 20s. Okay, and then after about um, 30 or so, um, density is gradually being lost, right? So just some background information there that's of importance. Okay, so factors that increase the risk of developing osteoporosis. You need to know the factors, but you also need to know why. Okay, so here's an explanation. So low um, estrogen, female, this is the female hormone, like so low estrogen levels um, can risk, um, increase the risk of developing osteoporosis. Okay, so why is this? Osteogen protects the bone against loss. Um, so what happens that females go uh, through menopause um, in their late 40s, 50s, um, early 50s. And so when they go through menopause, it means that they're going to have, they're losing estrogen. So this then means that bone loss increases. Okay, so that's why we find that osteoporosis is more um, pre prevalent in postmenopausal women. Okay, because... Um, of this um, hormone estrogen that normally protects the gut bone against loss um, of the proteins or the calcium, okay? So um, that's the reason. Then body shape, okay? Small, short people have less bone to lose than taller, large bone people, okay? So um, small, short people are at higher risk, in other words, to develop osteoporosis, um, and then if you have a family history of osteoporosis, you might also be genetically predisposed. So it puts you at a um, greater risk. Um, and then the disease of hormone producing glands. Okay, so when you've got an overactive thyroid, 
right? So if you have um, high levels of uh, thyroid hormones, um, it might also weaken the bones. Okay, so continuing with it, smoking, not good, increases bone loss. And then gender, um, we find that women normally have a lower bone mass than um, men. Okay, they, uh, um, and so that's why they at a higher risk than men, but men can also suffer from it. Um, excessive alcohol intake, okay, why is that? Because it prevents absorption of calcium into the bone. Okay, so that's why that's not good. And then sometimes long-term use of certain medications. Sometimes we find that people are, um, use medication that can also affect the bone strength over time. Um, and then, of course, your diet, a lack of sufficient calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and vitamin D intake prior to the age of 30. Okay, because remember um, that we st um, start losing bone density after the age of 30. So prior to that, we need to strengthen the bones and take in sufficient amounts of calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. And then also just aging brings about bone loss. Okay. Those are what you need to know. Um, okay. I'm just going to quickly go back to the notes. I don't want... Okay, so that's what I've been looking at. Um, so we want to have a look at prevention. Okay, so here you can see dietary adjustments. Okay, eat a balanced diet rich in calcium. Okay, where do we get our calcium from? Dairy products, green leafy products or vegetables, canned fish such as sardines, especially if you eat it with the bones because... Um, that's where the calcium is, nuts. And then, of course, um, take calcium supplements if your diet does not meet the requirements. Okay, it's important for developing bone mass and consequently strong bones, as you know from grade 10 already. And then some other important nutrients, adequate intake of vitamin D. Why vitamin D? Because vitamin D helps with the calcium absorption, calcium absorption into the bones. Where do we get vitamin D from? Oily fish, egg yolks, whole cream milk, margarine, these are good sources. We should also know that when our skin is exposed to um, sunlight, the body is able to manufacture vitamin D. Okay, and then other important nutrients, right, is, is adequate fluoride intake, okay, because this also ensures that the bones, bone is strengthened, okay, um, you'll see we find it in tap water there. And then ensure intake um, of sufficient kilojoules. A diet that's low in kilojoules lead to lower bone density. Okay, so you need to eat enough um, to help with um, um, your um, bone um, production. And then pro proteins and vitamin C is required for the normal collagen synthesis, right? Um, so proteins, we find that the bone also obviously um, consist of protein and collagen is important. So for the normal synthesis, collagen synthesis, we need vitamin C and proteins. Okay. Lifestyle adjustments and then management is what we're going to have a look at. So lifestyle, so is um, remember here once more, we've looked at dietary adjustments and now we're looking at lifestyle adjustments. Please know the difference between that. So do regular weight-bearing exercise, such as walking or jogging that strengthen the legs. Okay, this is um, throughout your life, obviously, and especially to strengthen the bones in younger years. And then we um, smoking, we know, is not good. It prevents absorption of calcium. Um, and then large amounts of um, alcohol also reduces bone mass. Um, right? Just quickly want to go back here. Okay, you will see, um, just wanted to look at um, this illustration over here also, um, where it says bone matrix, you can see um, um, what we've looked at earlier, but the curvature of the spine is also something that occurs due to bone loss, right? Um, 
I just want to quickly touch on some things. Right, okay, I've touched on those. Right. Okay, I think I basically touched on what I wanted to um, say about um, osteoporosis. So now I'd like to go back to... Let's go to the question paper because there's a question on osteoporosis that I want us to have a look at. Okay. Just want to find it. Okay, I'm going to go up to the question first because there's some information. Okay, here we go. You'll see it says study the information below that appears on the label of a pasta dish and uh, answer the questions that follow. So once more, here you've been given a source or resource um, that you are going to have to use when you answer. Okay, so you see a delicious pasta dish, free range beef and all of, you need to have a look at the ingredients because this is going to obviously lead you into answering, right? There's sp spinach, creamy cheese, fresh tomato, cheddar cheese. Then there's some more ingredients, modified corn flour. I'm just looking at a few, but you obviously going to have a look at it because you will see um, there's going to be some questions after this. Right, there's a Newton table as well included. Okay, so I want to get to the question where it says the following. Explain, I'm going to highlight it quickly. It says, yeah, explain, first of all, why this dish is suitable for the management of osteoporosis. Right, they don't say for, but once more, how are we going to be led to see? We're going to have a look at the mark allocation four times two. So I need to mention four things, right, and explain it, okay, because um, that's going to bring me to eight marks. Okay. Right, so let's quickly see at, look at the uh, memo. So if you can turn to the memo. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, now when you look at the information that was given to you, right? that information should lead you into answering because you now have already studied osteoporosis. You know the facts about osteoporosis. You know um, the dietary adjustments that you need to make. Okay, so this is basically what it's talking about when we want to manage osteoporosis. So now we can refer to what is um, all part of this, um, in, in, on this label. There's whole cream milk, there's cheddar cheese, there's spinach, what about that? They are all high in calcium. You need to mention it, right? What? Why is that important? Because calcium is important to develop bone, dense bone mass, to strengthen the bones. You know that, so you need to mention it. You need to refer to which ingredients is high in calcium and why it's important. Then we see there's egg yolk, there's whole cream milk, there's cheese. What? They contain vitamin D, okay? So what's the importance of vitamin D in the management of osteoporosis? It helps with calcium absorption into the bone. So we're going to say it, right? Um, there's water that contains fluoride. Um, the fluoride intake will ensure that the bones are strengthened as well, okay? Um, and then you will see um, the phosphates they're referring to also help with calcium absorption. But here yeah, the whole cream milk, minced meat, bacon, cheese, they all contain proteins, okay? So can you see why it's important that you know the nutrients, when we um, look at ingredients and we recognize the type of um, nutrients that we find within those ingredients, right? So why is proteins important in the management of osteoporosis? Because uh, they are required for normal collagen synthesis, okay? And then we've seen also there's tomatoes and we know tomatoes contain vitamin C and we also know that vitamin C is important um, for normal collagen synthesis as well. So we want to 
not just refer to the ingredients, um, um, look at the link um, to see what type of nutrients it, um, it's got, and then explain the importance of those nutrients. So this is how you want to answer something like that. You can see there's more than just eight, but you want to be guided, as I said, by the mark allocation for right times two facts that you're going to uh, mention, which is going to give you eight. Right, okay. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. I'm going, we're going to take a break over here, right? Um, and then we'll get back at 9.30. Okay, it's now 9.24 according to my time. Um, and then we're going to have a look at the re rest of the information, okay? Um, because we've only looked at um, nutritional diseases here. And we're going to come back with the rest of the information. But at this stage, I don't know if there's any Uh, Ma'am, just before we start again, uh, just a reminder again, please, colleagues at the venues, teachers, um, learners also just try to remind the teacher to complete the attendance register. There hasn't been any movement since uh, the last announcement, so I can still see only one school completing the attendance register. Please, it is very important for us to have that information. Um, thank you very much. Okay, right, let's um, 
continue. I hope you've got a little bit of a stitch in there. Right, so we are going to have a look at foodborne diseases. So if you can just go to foodborne diseases, it says food transferable. Once more, there um, a glitch due to translation. It should say foodborne diseases. So just change that. Right, and just before I'm going to have a look at the information on there, let's just quickly go to my slides. Okay, so first of all, um, we need to know what a foodborne disease is. Okay, um, what an incubation period is, as is there, you know, time between exposure to the organism and the first symptoms appearing, right? Um, and then the other things that's important is um, transmission. Okay, I'm just going to... Transmission possibilities. Okay, so you need to know how these foodborne diseases are transferred. Okay, and so those, um, that information, the human animal feces contaminated water, important, okay, um, that you know that. And then, of course, important also, how can transmission be prevented? Okay, good personal hygiene, hygienic preparation and storage of food, destroy bacteria by proper cooking, um, the, the um, keep food out of the temperature zone, danger temperature zone, should it, it should say five degrees to 60 degrees is that, if you remember that, and then prevent contamination of food, right? So that is important. And then, of course, very important is to wash your hands as we, as we see. So let me quickly just get back to um, your set of notes there. Okay, so what is important? We're going to have a look at um, hepatitis A. There you can see um, TB, tuberculosis, right? And then E. coli contamination and gastroenteritis. Those are the four that's of importance for you. And then the other thing that I just need to um, bring under your attention you will see that these parts in gray, symptoms and treatment, you do not have to know those. Okay, so those are no longer important. Okay, so it says here the dealer in gray, the parts in gray, you do not have. So just symptoms and treatment, these are not of importance. So you obviously need to know the difference between these three, um, sorry, these four um, um, foodborne diseases. Okay, so starting with hepatitis A there, contagious liver disease. Um, caused by hepatitis A, as you can see, um, how is it transferred? That's important, okay? And then incubation period is important, 15 to 50, 50 days after, inject, uh, after infection. Um, why is incubation um, period important? You will see with these, um, um, some of these um, foodborne diseases got common symptoms. So one of the ways in which to differentiate between um, whether it's the one or the other is by having a look at the incubation period. Okay, and then of course, how do we prevent it? Okay, so there's some general ways in which to prevent it, right, which is going to be applicable um, for most of them, right, besides um, TB. Okay, right, so that I'm not going to go into detail, right, TB um, caused by mycobacterium, Right, it can affect the lungs, but also attack the spine, the kidney, and the brain. Right, um, transferred through not this one, just please note TB is not uh, transferred through um, um, food, right? But uh, rather, through when somebody that is um, infected is in the same area or close contact, and that person sneezes, coughs spits talking or singing and the other person inhales it that is the way so this is yeah um tb is different to the other ones okay there you can see incubation period two to 12 weeks and then how are we going to prevent it cover mouth and nose if coughing or sneezing open windows in overcrowded rooms etc okay so please um note the difference over there and then when we come to e coli Okay, they live in the intestines of healthy people. Um, sometimes it can be harmful, okay? Um, and we know that diarrhea um, is one of the things that people normally suffer from, 
right? And that can lead to dehydration. Okay. Um, so when we have a look at um, the ways in which it's transferred, that's important. Three to seven days over a year incubation period. And then how are we going to manage this? So food handling practices or prevented, good personal hygiene, cook meat thoroughly, clean work uh, surfaces, well, et cetera, drink safe and clean water, boil water if unsafe. It's, so all of those are important. You will see there is some um, uh, common ways in which we can manage it, right? Because they are so alike, gastroenteritis, highly contagious, caused by um, virus, bacterial parasite, as you can see. Um, there we can see transmission. Okay, infected people um, that prepare food, uh, contaminated food or water that we drink when we're in contact with an inf infected person. Okay. Um, and this one, I don't know why the um, incubation time is not added, but this can be within a few um, hours to one to two days, right? So this one is almost immediate where you can um, get symptoms if you've been infected. Okay. Right. There's a question. So let me quickly go and have a look at the question. happen to that okay let's quickly have a look at the question now go up okay, let's get it getting getting to the question okay here you can see in the scenario again given um, read the scenario and answer the questions. So always please make sure that you read to understand what's happening here and know that if you are given a, a resource that um, they're going to be asking you, give reasons why learners are infected with the E. coli, what is the incubation period for E. coli, name three preventative measures that, that they could apply. Okay, let's go to the memo quickly. Right. Um, down okay so um why the learners are infected the half cooked mince meat patties food contaminated by feces contaminated um, water that the um, swam in could have been unpasteurized milk incubation period important there and then you can see there are three preventative how do we prevent preventative measures Okay, cook the mince patties thoroughly, rinse fruit with clean water, do not swim um, in um, contaminated water, boil water before you're going to drink it, boil milk before you're going to drink it. So um, it's once more here, when you've studied the information, okay, you um, sometimes are going to have to um, just regurgitate the information or you're going to have apply it to a resource as is the case also over here. Okay, so keep that in mind also. So what I want to um, show to you by having a look at the questions also is the importance of studying, remember, and remember so that you can apply um, the work um, properly, okay? Right, let's go back to your notes. The next thing we're going to have a look at is food additives. Okay, so um, you need to know what food additives are. As you can see over here, natural or chemical substances added to food during processing to perform certain functions. What are those fun functions? It can enhance taste, texture, appearance, quality, and shelf life. So we need to know those, right? Um, so now I'm just going to go back to my slides. Food additives. Okay, so you'll see there, um, when we have a look at food additives, okay, what it is, and then the general reasons for use um, of food additives will be those four, okay, to improve on nutritional quality, improve taste, texture, appearance, 
maintain and improve the safety and freshness of food and help process or prepare food. Okay, so those are things that you need to know. Okay, and then the different additives and their functions. Very important. So nutrients. Okay, so um, we add nutrients to food, right? Enrich it with food to improve the nutritional value. We've learned about fortification last year. Okay, so sometimes uh, food is fortified with nutrients to ensure a minimum amount of nutrients in certain foods, for example, maize meal. So, um, yes, so you need to know the different additives and know why these additives are added, emulsifiers are added. Um, particularly, um, you will see that <clears throat> when we have emulsifiers, emulsifiers are added because it must um, keep two immiscible substances mixed. So when we've got water and oil, Right, that normally doesn't mix. We need an emulsifier to prevent that from separating. Okay, so you find, you'll see when you have a look at your notes there, um, lecithin that's found in egg yolks and soy are used to form stable em emulsions. Okay, and uh, those emulsions are normally fo formed in mayonnaise, salad dressings, margarines, and ice creams. So you can see why it's important that you need to know the different um, emulsifier, uh, the different um, additives and then where they are used, okay, and what the importance we, the stabilizers that's used to improve the texture and appearance and body of food, okay, and these different types, gelatin, pectin, etc. So you need to know this bleaches and colorants used to whiten the food. Okay, so there's a different ones you need to grade um, twelves when you, and you're going to see when we have a look at a label, um, you will be able, you will have to be able to identify um, additives, right? Recognize the additives in a label, right? And then um, say what they are used for, what their fun functions are. So that's why um, these terms that we're talking about, or when we're talking about corn flour that's used as a thickening agent or calcium peroxide as a bleaching agent, right? Um, you need to you need to know these terms okay you need to know and be aware of these terms because you need to be able to recognize it when you get a label okay so and know the differences and the different functions chemical preservatives um that's added um to slow down spoilage by microorganisms okay um sulfur dioxide prevents browning in dry foods we get sulfites we get calcium propionate prevents the growth of mold on bread and baked goods and then, of course, nitrites and nitrates added to cured meats to preserve it. Um, benzoic acid. Okay, so all of these um, antioxidants improving the quality of food and extend their shelf life. Um, this is a lot of information, but it's information that you need to know, unfortunately. Okay, so that is what I'm trying to say. You need to know the different additives and their functions and then examples um, that we have under um, these ones, okay? These are um, additives to improve taste, right? So we get some natural ones, uh, sugar, et cetera, and we also get artificial of, um, sweetness, right? Um, monosodium, monosodium glutamate, MSG. Okay, there's just a few things that I'm going to um, change on your notes. Um, and that reminds me, so I'm quickly going to go back here. So that you see that all of this on my slides you actually also have, right? So I just think that there was also, so yeah, I've gone over all, I'm not going to go into detail with all of these. These are things that you just have to go and study, right? Um, okay. Then some other information. List of food additives on food labels should be indicated in the list of ingredients. <clears throat> if tartazine is used, and you're going to see why we talk about that, um, it should be listed in the list of ingredients as well. And then um, it says sodium glutamate, monosodium glutamate over here, MSG. Yeah, it says MNG. That is why I wanted to come back here because I know that with the translation, some of the things. So it's MSG, monosodium glutamate. Okay, it flavors, it's almost like um, salt. Okay, it flavors the food to bring out the, um, or flavor enhancer to bring out the flavor in food. So they must be um, indicated. Okay, and then an antioxidant must be indicated by its chemical name or abbreviation. Right?
and then the food um, additive safety of food additives, you will see that um, the what is permitted to be used um, in food in order for it to be safe is guided and controlled by the Food Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act of 1972. And this actually helps and ensure that the control of South African food meets the world standards. Okay. Um, now, some people we find, right, that food additives are relatively safe because of the fact that they get tested, right, um, regularly to make sure that they are safe to use. Um, but even though that might be the case, we still find that some people might have reactions to food additives. Some people might be allergic. Some people might have reactions. It's the same like... Um, when we've got allergies, some people are, might be allergic to certain food, um, um, of cert certain pr proteins in food, etc. So the same with, with food additives as well. Okay, so the ones that's permitted, the ones that's allowed to be used in the food um, industry, right? These are tested, um, and so we can it can be regarded as um, relatively safe. Um, some of the dangerous or um, the ones with the negative reactions are the following. So they're talking about, um, and I'm trying to open my little note here because it says starters, but it must say um, ammonia sodium glutamate. I don't know why this one doesn't want to open. Tartazine, sorry, sorry, not MSG. Um, this one must say tartazine, the orange artificial yellow dye, because um, it's been linked to hyperactivity in kids. So these are um, also some information that you need to um, know if you have to um, sub, sub, if you have to um, state um, or talk about it. Okay. And then uh, the M in, MSG ones here, monosodium M, monosodium glutamate. I'm so sorry, MNG. Not fragrance enhancer, flavor enhancer, okay? Um, and also seen as a, a bit of dangerous and there's like controversy about these additives because of the fact that certain people still have um, reactions to it, okay? Same with um, sodium benzoate, hyperactivity, and then um, nitrates and nitrites. Um, it's a chemical preserver, preservative used to age meat, but um, it's also been linked to um, cancer forming Okay, so carcinogenic. Okay, so um, just be aware of that. Um, and then aspartame, it's an artificial sweetener, has been blamed for a wide range of ad adverse effects in humans. Okay. So then the classification of E numbers, I'm going to open up my slide here. Okay, it is just something that you need to be aware of. Um, okay, um, in Europe, they make use of the E numbers. The E numbers, if something has got an E number, that's an indication that it is an, um, a food additive. Okay, you don't have to know which E number is used for which um, category, right? Um, but these are normally approved. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, if they are safe to use, they are given an E number. Right, so be aware of that. Okay. I have spoken about those. Then just in your, I'm going to go back to your notes. Okay, so E numbers is just an indication. Yeah, those are the numbers that's used to indicate the, the additive, right, and the category of the additive, but um, it, it's indicate that it's been safe to use. Okay. So, yeah, in your, um, if you just quickly go to this Doritos pack over here, so you can be given a label as is the case over here, and then asked to identify the additives, the different types of additives, and give an example of an ingredient and its function. Okay? Um, so there you will see there's antioxidants in, in there. Okay? So preserve and prevent fats that become rancid. So what I want you to note over here is, this is what I said, you need to be able to recognize um, 
or identify the food additive if you are given a list as easier um, and and that's why it's important that you also know the function of these additives okay because um, besides the fact that you're going to have to be able to identify recognize them you will then have to be able to answer questions such as ease over here okay so here you'll see seasonings um, and and the function of it okay quite a few um, here's another one okay identify the type of additives used in the ice cream and then um, it could have furthermore said and the function and give the function so there's an emulsifier okay so um, prevents the oil or liquids from um, separating these seasonings it improves the taste there's dyes that improves the appearance appearance and these stabilizers that gives it an even texture okay so as you can see right there's colorants or dyes flavorings etc so you um, can expect to get something like this so it's just to give an example of how it can be asked can also be obviously asked in shorter questions okay then they can also use labels, right? When we've looked at the nutrient content um, on labels, um, where it says evaluate the suitability of the baker's. No, we're going to come. Yeah, no, no. We can 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 use this. This is more with labeling as well. Evaluate. Okay, so you need to look at it thoroughly. Suitability of the baker's breakfast cookies for a diabetic. Okay, so. There are certain things that you want to go and have a look at, so like energy. Okay, so you have a look at the energy and you see um, the energy is 1,910 kilojoules per 100 grams, which is very high because everything is compared to that 100 grams over there. Um, the sugar is also very high. Okay, so then um, when you are given something like this, you should also be able to, to look at what is on the label and then check to see whether it is high or low and whether it is suitable or not. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. I'm gonna um, step off and then we're gonna go into food labeling. Quite a lot of information. Once more, as you can see, grade 12s, I'm gonna keep on repeating this this needs a lot of studying you cannot cannot sit the afternoon before you're going to write you need to plan your um have your um study schedule and then divide your work so that you can thoroughly engage with the work and make sure that you know your work as you can see not difficult work a lot of work okay and then the ability to apply your information is also important right so now we get on to food labeling okay um so important to the, know the three main objectives of food labeling which is there to protect the consumer it's to provide the information about a specific food it's to, it's to help them with choosing a healthy diet um so how do we achieve these three goals right we list the ingredients okay so that um the consumers can avoid because sometimes people might be, due to their religion, they can't eat certain things. It might be that they, um, due to their health, they might be diabetic, they might have autosclerosis or heart condition, so they can't eat certain things, so they must make informed choices. And so that's why um, we need to provide them with information on labels. That's why it's important, okay? Um, then nutritional information, so that will help them make um, um, informed choices because they can also compare food products and then, of course, storage and preparation instructions to ensure that the food is safe, stays safe so that people know how to have it so that it stays safe to eat. Okay, I'm going to go on to my um, labeling slide. Okay, now, basic information that must appear on food labels, you will have to go and have a look at it. I'm not going to go over all of it. Um, you have a good idea because we've started looking at information that must be on food labels already in grade 10. Okay, so yeah, it's just a little bit um, 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 more. Okay, so all of these, you need to know um, the different types of information that must appear, right? And then the difference there between the date stamps, best before, sell by, use by. Okay, have a look at that. And then there's the nutritional information. 
okay? Um, it must comply with the following specifications. It must be in a tabular format as is over here. Um, and then, of course, values for energy, protein, fats, fiber, carbohydrates, and sodium should be given as per 100 gram or 100 moles, as you can see. Okay. Um, so that's important over there. Okay, I'm going to go back to your set of notes for this. Let's go down. So you will find that most of the information of what must be on a label, you already have a good idea about. So yeah, that is some, some stuff that you need to know. Um, now, in South Africa, labeling is also guided by law. Okay, so people can't just put anything on a label because what people have done in the past, they would put stuff on a label just to get um, and give people false information so that people can purchase the product. So that's why this is now also, um, um, there is prescribed laws, etc. So you'll see it says here, the Department of Health has administered a law dealing with the labeling and advertising of food products, right? So um, in order to not have people make nutrition claims um, about there's a, a high fiber or low fat, or whatever the case may be, there's certain prescriptions, okay? So we're going to have a look at, if they want to make certain claims, what are the conditions? So this is important, okay? So if they say, if they say energy is, so this is also stuff that you need to know. If the claim is that there's a low energy, okay? A, 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 this is all co in comparison to 100 grams of solid food. In order to say something is low in energy, it must be less than 170 kilojoules, right? High is not, it's, it's 950 and above, so low is 170 and below, okay? And then when we have a look at fat, um, 3 grams per 100 gram and less, 3 grams and less per 100 grams, saturated fats, One, if they want to say it's low in saturated fats, it must be... Um, 1.5 grams and lower, and then with cholesterol, okay, um, there you can see cholesterol, there you can see um, sodium, right, um, and then high in carbohydrates must be 13 um, or above, dietary fiber, 2.4 grams or above, and proteins 10 grams or above, so that's information that you also need to know because um, if you are given a label, if the label states that it's high in fiber, then you need to, in order to see whether this Newton claim is true, you will then have to have a look at the Newton content. Like, for example, so you're going to go to the Newton content on the label. And if it is, if we have a look at fiber, if the fiber is, let's say, 1.5 per 100 grams, then it's not true. Okay, if it's if it's 2.4 and above, then it's true. Okay, so that is how we look to see whether a Newton claim is true or false, right? So that is why you need to know the stable in order for you to also check to see if they say it's low in fat, right? Then it must mean that it is three grams or less per hundred grams. So that is um, why that table is important. And then also, there are some misleading claims on nutritional con uh, content, right? Um, so there's certain things that can be misleading and is prohibited. They may not use it unless they can prove it, right? So those are misle misleading descriptions that, can't, that um, can only be used or allowed only if the food products comply with their natural nature, poor, to uh, pure, traditional homemade, handmade, can only be used, otherwise it becomes misleading, right? If the food product complies with it. And then food fr um, frozen and later thought may not be sold as fresh because it can be dangerous for people. Okay, and some other prohibited statements, any words, image, logo, brand that gives the impression that is supported by organizations, associations, only if a, this is approved by the Department of Health can they use that. So they can't just use um, um, wording and illustrations and logos and brands and things willy-nilly without the approve, approval of the Department of Health. 
right? Um, and then words, endorsements um, uh, by the manufacturer or in the form of a logo regarding nutritional safety features of the food unless it's valid according to regulations in law. So we, you just need to be aware of all of this, right? Words like healthy or health, wholesome, nutritious, okay? Um, as we said, it can only be used if it um, complies with um, if it complies, okay? So please be aware of those words and then some negative claims, right? Um, it says there, no, no implication may be placed on a label stating that the food product, um, that only that it contains a particular characteristic pro property ingredient when the similar products also do not contain it, right? Um, so negative claims here, um, like for example, if we think in terms of um, cholesterol and fruit and vegetable, if, if it's a fruit or vegetable product, they cannot put on the zero cholesterol because fruit and vegetables are naturally free from cholesterol. Okay, so please keep that in mind. And then comparative claims there, reduce less than less light or light when referring to the total fat, right? Um, so we know that if they do make claims, right, it must adhere to those conditions that we've gone over okay so here is um how to read labels okay so when we have a look at um you'll see the carbohydrates we look at the glycemic carbohydrate there you can see of which the total is um of sugar okay um so you need to have a look at that there's portion size remember we always compare to 100 grams Right, there's dietary fiber. Um, so we know what the conditions are. Aim for three grams or more per 100 grams in order for it to be high. Right, um, aim for less than 120 milligrams per 100 grams if it's salt. Okay, so these are fats. It says feta here, fats. So can once more, I want you to, um, in when you are going to be able to evaluate something like that, is only if you know If you know this, okay, so you need to know that in order for you to answer um, when, um, when you have a look at um, whether the statements are true or false, and then of course the misleading nutritional um, information that we sometimes find on labels, okay? I hope you're all still with me. It's such a lot of information, I know. Um, but this is information that we've done through the term. So um, it's being repeated and when you study, you're going to be repeating it. So um, it's all going to help. Right. I'm just going to the... Okay, let's quickly go up to the label. I know there's a question on the label again also. Here we go. You can see we've done additives. Here it says identify the type of additive in each case and provide a function of the additive. So lecithin, mustard powder, sodium nitrate, the type of additive. Okay, so you must say it's an emulsifier, it's a flavor enhancer and the function in the dish. Okay, um, so what is the function? So you can see a, a different way in which it's been answered. And then remember, it says tabulate your answer. If, it's, if it asks you to tabulate, you need to tabulate. Otherwise, you're going to lose a mark, which is that's unnecessary. Okay, um, then we go down. It says 3.4.3. Study the nutrition table. Can the label make the food assumption that is low in fat? Motivate your answer. So then you go and have a look. Total fat is 6.6 .6 per 100 gram. So when we go back to our table, we see in order for, for it to say that it's low fat, it must be 3 grams or less. 
So then you, you just say, let's go and have a look at the answer so that you can see. Here it is. So you will see that if you remember, as I've said now once more, in order for something to be classified or the, the claim to be made that it's low in fat, it must be three grams or less per hundred grams of total fat. So now the answer is going to be no, because now we've gone and where do we find that information? We find it on the label, right, on the nutrient content, and we see at 6.6, .6, so no, first of all. Can the label make the food assumption? There's a question asked. You must answer that question yes or no, and then you must motivate. So please don't forget to always either say yes or no in a, a case like this. There it's no, and then you're going to motivate. Low in fat, fat content should be less than 3 grams per 100 grams of food. This is 6.6 .6 per 100 grams. Okay, so that is how you want to um answer something like that okay let's go back right we're almost at the end hell oh, um, hang in there hang in there right we want to get through the last of the work that we've covered in term one and two. So now we are going to go through um, consumer issues here. And so we're going to have a look at genetically modified foods. We're going to have a look at organic foods. We're going to have a look at irradiated foods, right? Okay. Okay, I'm just quickly gonna go over to my food related consumer issues. So the first thing that we're looking at is um, genetically modified foods, GMOs, right? And we need to know what it is. Okay, we need to know what, what, what do they mean when they talk about foods being genetically modified, right? Um, so we know that with a genetic modification, right, it is when um, the genes is changed, right? Um, so we want to give um, the food a longer shelf life, we want to give it a different color, we want to bring in more nutrients, etc. And it's possible to do that. So you need to know um, that with genetic modification, right, um, it can change the characteristics um, because it can extract or um, identify and, and then um, put different genes into different organisms to get a different result. So, yeah, your understanding of GMOs there is important. Okay. Um, I want to go back to your notes. No, not that one. That one. Okay, so get an understanding of what it is, okay? Um, we know that genetically modification is done to benefit um, the masses, for example, um, to be able to grow things in areas where it couldn't grow before, to enable it to um, withstand certain um, weather conditions, etc. okay? So when you look at um, genetically modified foods, You'll see here, we're looking at the advantages. But the advantages have been subdivided. What are the advantages for the farmers? What are the advantages for the food producers and manufacturers? What are the um, um, advantages for the consumer? So these are advantages that you need to know. Okay. So, um, but this has been set up nicely so that because sometimes they ask in a question, they will ask um, specifically what will um, genetically modified, what will the advantage of genetically modified be for the consumer or the farmer? Um, they might ask it generally, then you can obviously give any of these. Um, but otherwise, if they ask specifically, then um, you should know it specifically as is in this or this. The way it's set out here makes it a bit easier for you um, to study from then. Okay, I'm not going to go over all of that. 
when there's advantages, there's also disadvantages. Okay. Um, so there are the disadvantages that you also need to know. Right. Um, and then there are concerns. Okay. In order for you to be able to also um, give your opinion, sometimes you need some background information. Right. So this, um, that's why I also say in your textbooks, there might be more background reading. Please do go and have a look at that as well. So it just gives you more, a better understanding, okay, and, and, and more things to build your own um, opinion with. So um, the concerns, because there are concerns about genetically modified products, right, um, the, because people still don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on crops and the environment and on humans' health, etc. So that is the concern. Um, so long-term effects, because they haven't been studying it for long, it's not been something that's been done for a long time. So that is one of the, the problems. Um, and then you'll see here, it will say one of the other concerns is GM. Um, um, genetically modified foods can cause toxicity or allergic reactions. And the reason here behind this is that um, if somebody's allergic to nuts, right, um, if they've taken something from the nut gene and transplanted into something else and the person that's allergic does not know, this can be very dangerous. So these are some of the concerns, right, um, um, that um, people have about it. Uh, there is no specific data proving that genetically modified food is harmless, um, but it is still vague. And scientific um, development and research has only recently taken place. So there is no 100% um, with certainty that they can say that there's not, no problems with it. So that is just some um, background info that you need to be... Um, be aware of and have in the back of your mind in case you have to um, state or agree or disagree with something, etc. Okay. Right. So that's genetically modified products. Then we move on to organically produced foods. So when we look at genetically modified foods, we know that organically produced foods are the opposite. That's the opposite of genetically modified food because here um, the food... Um, is being um, produced naturally, okay? Um, so you need to know what this is without the use of arti artificial fertilizers, pesticides, uh, um, herbicides, um, GMOs, and growth stimulants. Stimulant. So this is basically, if we have a look at genetically modified foods, we know that there's altering taking place, but here the, the fruit and vegetables, it's allowed or the crops are allowed to grow um, as natural as they possibly can, right? Um, and so you'll see here, the aim is to ensure optimal functioning of the soil, plants, animals, and humans, right? Um, so, yeah, you need to know what organically produced food, what it is, right? There you can see um, some of the traditional farming methods that they use to keep the soil and plants healthy. So here we want to see... Um, or here we're going to see why it's also um, good for the environment, okay, or why it's not good for the environment, etc. So you want to um, be aware of that as well, right? There's the properties of organically grown food, no gen genetically, it's not genetically modified, food from harmful chemicals, pesticides, free of hormones, it tastes better, they say, right? And then um, you'll see with organic farmers, right? Concentrate on creating favorable conditions for life, their livestock. Remember, we talk about organic fruit and vegetables, but we also talk about free range. So that term would also um, refer to organic farming, where they um, allow their livestock to graze and live freely. Okay, so please be aware of that. Um, animals are healthier than livestock animals and are not given antibiotics. Um, so know the difference between, I would say, um, genetically modified foods and organic foods, know the definitions there, know advantages and disadvantages. And so here are advantages and disadvantages, okay? 
Um, so in terms of um, the environment, you will see less fuel is used, no fuel is used to make organic fertilizer, there's less pollution. So if they ask about advantages for the environment, these are things that you want to refer to, less pollution, waste material is plowed back into the ground, right? It's healthier, less chemicals and pesticides, the residues on fruits and vegetables. So this is going to be better maybe for the, for the end user, the consumer, right? Um, so please note here, you want to see what are they asking? Are they talking about the environment? Are they talking about for the, for the consumer, right? So make, um, have a look at that. No growth hormones, more jobs, okay? Because this is very labor intensive. So more workers are needed. So when we have organically, uh, organic farms, et cetera, they obviously need more um, people to work. So that's good. But then there's also disadvantages. To start up with uh, organic farming and organic farming is normally more expensive. And we also see because they need more um, laborers, it's more labor intensive, right? And we also find that this, the harvest are smaller. Um, because they are, might not be protected against um, certain um, conditions, etc. Like, for example, with the GMOs. So in that instance, it might be a disadvantage. Um, stains may occur um, that we don't get in the GMOs, right? So have a look at the disadvantages. Um, in the, um, you'll see that local farmers cannot keep up with the demand, um, right? And then they may have to import and this can lead to air pollution which then adds to global warming right um, and then um, please note here with organic farming um, the um, one of the things that is uh, goes into the um, soil is a copper sulfate um, which poison earthworms and fish so that um, is uh, might not be a good thing okay the shelf life might be shorter no preservatives are added so yeah it's a lot of work you will have to study. I can't, I can't stress that enough. I'm glad that you're here and you see, if we have a look at everything in a nutshell, you get a bigger and a better picture so you see. Okay, so here are requirements for an organic label. Must have been farmed organically on the land for two years. Crop rotation must be applied to fields. Only approved organic fertilizers and pesticides may be used. Okay, so what are your requirements? Um, for you to have an organic label to say that your products or your produce is um, organic, those are the requirements. And then the guidelines for buying organic products here, this is obviously now for the consumer. Um, okay. There you can see choose fresh items poss um, possible, fresh items as it has a short lifespan. Um, yeah, have a read through this as well. Okay, uh, stuff that you. Um, need to be aware of okay right then we move on because we've got um we're going to be able to to deal with all of what we wanted to deal with today we're moving on to irradiated food okay so we find um that food can be radiated using very short radio and um, uh, lights and why is this done Okay, this is done to improve safety um, and increase shelf life. Um, okay, let me go to my... And, um, just quickly coming back, there's just some type of labeling that they sometimes use to indicate that something is organically grown. Okay, but I'm over here now with irradiated food. Right, there you can see the red dura um, emblem that they sometimes use to indicate that the food has been irradiated. Right, there you can see the types of food. You need to be aware of the types of foods that's um, irradiated. Right, um, you will find that foods with high fat is normally not irradiated. Um, the more common ones is herbs and spices, and this is due to the bacterial load because of the drying process and the way they are grown. Um, then just in terms of um, safety, okay, because that might also be a concern for people, what you need to know is that food has been irradiated or, um, for the past 50 years. It's endorsed by the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization in South Africa and, and, and approved by the Department of Health. So that gives us an idea that it is relatively safe and an effective way to use. Okay. And then, of course, you need to know the advantages. 
um, reduce or eliminate the number of pathogenic bacteria and harmful organisms, prevent foodborne diseases, very important there. Um, it's used to destroy organisms that cause food spoilage, right? Um, delays the sprouting of onions, garlic, and potatoes, and also delays greening of potatoes. So this actually helps that um, fresh fruit and vegetables can then be um, also transported from one area to another. And because it's now got a longer shelf life because it's been um, irradiated. Um, del delays the ripening of fruit, right? So if fruit and stuff is imported, we sometimes get avocados available out of, out of season. Okay, stuff that we sometimes get um, um, out of season might, um, they might have used um, this method, okay, to make it, um, to delay the ripening process, right? So those are stuff um, that you need to know. Okay, I'm coming back to your set of notes. Not that one, that one. Okay, so um, the notes has been set out nicely for you to understand easily and study easily from. There are the disadvantages as well. Okay, so please note that. I've already indicated that at your symbol that they use. Right, and then the last information that we're getting to. It's almost weekend, people. Last information. Local food production and food security in South Africa. Okay, so first of all, great tiles, you need to know what food security is. Okay, so um, to understand it, right, you need to know the definition. It says, when all people, okay, when we have a look at the definition, this is important, at all times have access to enough nutritious food to enable them to maintain a healthy and active life. So these are all the um, different aspects of the definition that you want to remember, okay? So that you have an idea of what is food security. It basically means that in an area, in a country, the people always have access to enough nutritious food um, that's going to enable them to um, lead a healthy and active life. So that is basically what food security is. Um, and you will see here, it's got three dimensions, food availability, Enough food must be available on an ongoing basis at a national and domestic level. Access to food. People must have enough resources to obtain food for a nutritious diet on a sustainable basis. Food use. It must be consumed appropriately based on knowledge. That is why basic um, nutrition and care is important. So um, remember that when we have a look at consumer studies, consumer studies also has got to do with um, what is happening in the macro environment um, and how does it affect the consumer? Okay, so if we have a look at um, KwaZulu Natal, for example, in an area where the looting has happened, um, people don't, um, might, be, uh, that area might become food insecure now because um, people might not have access to, um, because this, 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 the shops and those places are no longer there available. So, um, the access to the food has been compromised, okay? And so then we can talk about now their food security is also being compromised. So please be aware of um, issues that's happening around you also because it can be brought into a question like this as well. Okay, so um, ideal now to use, right? And to talk about, all right, so with the world, um, the the World Health Organization has got to, uh, or their concern is, is there enough food for people all over the world, right? And the distribution, etc. Have a read through that um, information there. Um, in South Africa, we are seen as a, um, a, a country that's food secure. Okay, why are we seen as a country as food secure generally? Okay, because we might have pockets. Um, of areas where people are poorer and might um, we might have problems with food security. But in general, um, we are food, so regarded as food secure because we produce uh, most of the food that is needed, right, um, for, the, for the population. So we produce the food to meet the basic needs of the population. Um, it has the ability to import food if necessary. Okay, so we've got those systems going. Um, so that is why it's regarded as being food secure. 
Um, so what I've mentioned is there might be families who are experience food insecurity due to low income. They don't have um, the means to purchase what they need, right? Um, poverty and unemployment, okay? So that's why I'm saying in general, but we can also take it to certain um, certain areas of where people are living, where they might um, be dealing with that. So a high level of unemployment we have in South Africa, we know that there's insufficient social grants and the high incidence of AIDS can contribute to this problem where we are insecure. So we can look at what are the factors that make us secure, okay, food secure, or what are the factors that is going to um, um, lead to food insecurity, which has been also um, touched on there. So those are things that you must be aware of. Okay, then just in terms of local food production, we see that in South Africa, um, we are able to produce most of the food that we need, okay, um, and where we fall short, we are able to import, okay, so which is good. So here's a um, few factors or few terms that you also need to know. Um, you will find self-sufficient, Okay, when we think in terms of local food production, we talk about not self-catering, please, self-sufficient. Um, so we find that some people might be self-sufficient because they've got, um, to a certain degree, because they might have um, chickens and they can produce eggs and they might have cows and they can produce milk, etc. But very few people are self-sufficient, okay, because they, they might have a certain, a few few things some people might be doing it on a smaller scale. If we think in terms of the farmers, they're doing it on a, big, on a bigger scale. Um, but they are... Um, they still need to get other stuff from other places. So please know what self, um, when we talk about self-sufficiency, what it means. Um, then they talk about the import exports of South Africa. Okay. Um, we are able to, uh, to export because we produce enough, right, to, um, to help with that. And then with imports also, right, um, no, obviously if stuff, sometimes if stuff, is, um, if we fall short, if we have a doubt, if something is happening and we can't produce, then we need to import, okay, so that we um, have enough um, for South Africans. So, um, but sometimes it can become more expensive. Be, know that, um, be aware of all of that, all terms that you need to know. Okay. Um, I stuck to our time. It's 28 minutes past 10. <laughs> We have touched on everything. I think um, I've touched on all the important aspects. Um, it is now your responsibility to take um, control um, um, and know that you are responsible for um, the mark that you're going to get at the end of the year or next year when you get your um, results. It's, it's all dependent on you. You can um, achieve what you want to, but you will have to put in the hard work. So I hope that you're going to put in the hard work. I hope the sessions were um, informative and helpful. Um, the more you engage with certain material, you, the, the more you tend to retain information. So you need to, as I've said, when I started um, grade 12s, you need to find ways in which you can um, study the subject and retain the information. But I just want to say thank you to everybody, all the teachers. Um, I want to say thank you to um, everybody that's been working in the background um, and helping, making this possible. Um, it has been a privilege for me to be doing this. Um, and hopefully, um, um, as I said, um, you could take a lot, can take a lot from these sessions. Right. Um, just a reminder that after the session, there's a session with the higher education institutions. There's information that you might need. So please don't forget about that. But it was awesome to be um, sharing this information with you. And as I said, I hope it's going to help you a lot. Thank you so much.